Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Pamela Howard Forum on Global Crisis Reporting. Uh, my name is Paul Adepoji, and I'm the community manager uh, for the forum. Over the last, a couple of, the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at different issues that we consider to be of top priority and of interest to journalists uh, in different parts of the world. And the issue of uh, the food, uh, the global food crisis, is something that we strongly believe needs the attention of journalists in different parts of the world. But this issue uh, is goes uh, comes much uh, stronger to individuals in different parts of the world uh, to another. For instance, we are in a part of the world that there are famine, there are, uh, there are conflicts, uh, you will be able to quickly, is more easily connect with uh, the gravity, the serious nature of the global food crisis. But if you are in the part, in other parts of the world where this, uh, these crises are not happening, you may think uh, may, maybe uh, the global food crisis is something that is being blown out of proportion. Uh, last year, uh, during the uh, the global uh, climate change conference uh, in in Glasgow, Scotland, that I attended and we hosted a session live. Uh, one of the major points that the arguments that were that was being made uh, to justify the prioritization of addressing climate change was the fact that it is also fueling uh, the global food crisis. And some examples were given in some parts of the world and uh, participants and uh, global leaders were called upon to actually do something urgent to actually do this, um, intervene and help uh, those that are in the middle of this crisis to be able to better deal with them. But many individuals don't know how serious this is. And um, this is why we've said uh, we decided to bring uh, a top expert that would have uh, as much information as we are going to need regarding this issue to be able to join us today. So I'm talking about Maximo Torero Kulen, uh, who is the Chief Economist uh, for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Hi, Maximo, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, how are you? Nice to join you. Yes, thank you for joining us today and uh, our participants and uh, our audience, uh, wherever you are joining us from, uh, we always like to know where you are joining us from. Uh, so please uh, sh share where you are joining us from. And uh, I, I am in Rome, based in Rome. Oh, it seems that our host has frozen. My apologies. Hello, everyone. I'm Stella Roque. I'm Director of Community Engagement at ICFJ. I'm just going to step in for Paul until he gets his technology working again. Thank you again for joining us, Maximo. I guess you have a presentation to give to our participants, so I'm going to let you get started. Okay, great. So thank you so much. And let me start my, my presentation so that we can move. Okay, so essentially what I was planning to do today is to clarify some of the concepts that we normally hear and, and sometimes we, we don't know exactly what are the differences. So, so we need to understand what are the global food crisis and, and the terminology and also what is behind. So there are, in FAO, we have two big publications uh, uh, and, and they mean different things. So first, what is food security? Essentially, there is food security when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. To foster food security across the world, FAO and its partners seek to address all forms of food insecurity. There are two main forms of food insecurity which often overlap. The first one is acute or transitory food insecurity, and that is captured with the global report on food crisis. And the GRFC numbers is a short-term, possibly temporary inability to meet food consumption requirements related to sporadic crises, conditions that can be highly susceptible to change and can manifest in a population within a short time frame as a result of sudden changes or shocks. This is the type of food insecurity that requires immediate humanitarian action. On the other hand, we have what we call chronic uh, food insecurity, and this is captured by the prevalence of undernourishment or severe food insecurity as measured with the food insecurity experience scale, the FIES that we developed. And is provided in our SOFI publication, the publication in your right-hand side, 
the state of food insecurity and nutrition in the world. And this report brings a long-term or persistent inability to meet food consumption and requirements. So acute food insecurity is more a short-term issue. Chronic food insecurity is more a long-term issue. The two reports are highly complementary. Acute and chronic food insecurity are not mutually exclusive phenomena. Indeed, repeated shocks and persistent crises can provoke upsticks in severe food insecurity and chronic food insecurity, forcing, forcing households into destitution and chronic poverty and potentially leading to starvation. While acute food insecurity, the short-term one, may require shorter-term interventions that address immediate causes. Interventions tracking root causes may also be important to prevent repeated transitory acute food insecurity, which may lead to chronic food insecurity. Decision makers worldwide can largely benefit from the findings of the two reports. In particular, a food crisis occurs when rates of acute food insecurity and malnutrition rise sharply at local or national levels, raising the need for emergency food assistance. So, Two definitions, the definition of what is a food crisis is mostly measured in based on acute food insecurity. Now, the IPC classification is the main tool used and that has been the global gold standard for classification of acute food insecurity and malnutrition, including the declaration of amines. The IPC uh, classification and its companion in West Africa, the Cadre Harmonisé, is the primary source of estimates of acute food insecurity in over 45 countries and informs the allocation of over 7 billion of humanitarian assistance annually. The global report on food, food crisis is produced twice a year by 16 partners and reports on the magnitudes and severity of acute food insecurity. It provides information on the global number of people who are in the three most severe phases of acute food insecurity according to the IPC and the Cadre Harmonisé classification. The crises are IPC and Cadre Harmonization Phase 3, Emergency, IPC or Cadre Harmonization Phase 4, and catastro Catastrophe, which is IPC classification Phase 5. So what we try to avoid is arriving to Phase 5, of course. And when we arrive to Phase 3, 4, or 5, we declare an emergency because we need to provide immediate assistance. When in a crisis, IPC phase three, people start facing increasing malnutrition due to the lack of food, or they are only able to access food by selling off assets or through other harmful coping strategies. People in emergency IPC phase four face high levels of acute malnutrition and excess mortality due to the lack of food or resort to emergency coping strategies to mitigate large food consumption gaps. People in catastrophe in the IPC phase five do not have any means, any means left to access to food and are facing a starvation and death. Famine should be avoided at all costs. So we should never allow it to be in phase three, five. But historically, we have had in case, several cases of famine. Stress conditions or the IPC2 in yellow color here are also relevant in food crisis context. Although these require a more diverse set of actions than emergency response. Ideally, longer term resilience, building and disaster risk reduction to protect livelihoods. So this is the whole level of different phases that we have to uh, act and to evolve. And as I said before, from phase three to phase four, we need to act immediately and we should always try to avoid phase five. The global report uh, on food crisis of 2021 estimated that around 155 million people had experienced acute food insecurity and were in need of urgent assistance. This is IPC phase, phase three or above. In 2020, 55 countries or territories that asked for external assistance and a precedented, an unprecedented level as per five editions of the report. By September 2021, when the mid-year update of the global report was issued, this number has risen to 161 million people in 42 countries and territories. These figures surpass the already high 2020 figure, despite the absence of 2021 estimates for 13 countries and territories included in the GRFC 2021, notably for the Syrian Arab Republic, 
which was classified as one of the world largest food crises in 2020. So we need to be careful that the sample of countries is different because of availability of information. But despite that, the number increased significantly. Early indications from the ongoing analysis for 2022 global report are that the figure continued to rise in the second half of 2021. Our preliminary est estimates by December 2021 indicate again a significant increase in countries affected by food crises, similar to 2020, with around 190 million people in IPC3 or above or equivalent. Already in 2020, around 133,000 people were estimated in catastrophe, meaning IPC5, the worst that could ever happen. Across three countries affected by major food crises during preliminary by conflict and insecurity. This is Burkina de Faso, South Sudan, which concentrated most of the affected population, and Yemen. By mid-2021, a total of 584,000 people were projected to be in catastrophe phase five and required urgent action to prevent widespread starvation, death, and total collapse of their livelihoods in four countries, Ethiopia, 401,000 people in Tigray region in July and September 2021, South Sudan, 108,000 people in April, July 2021, Yemen, 47,000 in January to June 2021, and Madagascar, 28,000 in the Grand Sud in October to December 2021 because of the huge drought that they were facing. Several other countries included in this update witnessed alarming levels of populations in emergency, meaning IPC phase four. Now, the number identified in 2021 edition, reporting 2020 acute food insecurity estimates, is the highest in the report's five-year existence. The increasing trend between 2016 and 2020 reflects the wider availability of food security data, including in previously inaccessible areas or in contexts where data quality was poor. However, it also reflects worsening levels of acute food insecurity. The number of people in crisis or worse in 2020 was nearly 20 million higher than in 2019. The additional people were mainly in 12 food crisis countries and territories. The Democratic Republic of Congo and the Syrian Arab Republic with around 6 million more each, Nigeria, 15 states and the FCT, and, and the Sudan with around 4 million more each, Afghanistan, Burkina Faso and Honduras, or with around 2 million more each, and Burundi, Cameroon, and Mozambique, Sierra Leone, and Uganda, all with about 1 million more each. Over the five editions of the annual GRFC, the country coverage varied from 48 to 55 countries, resulting from the country selection process to define and delimit food prices, acute food insecurity data available for the country selected. And the rigorous selection process rests on two sets of criteria. First, countries and territories that requested external assistance for food and or are faced shocks as assessed by the FAO use. And two, low income, low middle income countries, territories that did not meet FAO use criteria, but require external assistance as a result of a shock, such as conflict, displacement, weather extremes, or economic shocks. As an indication in the last edition, the GRFC issue in May 2021, covering 2020, 79 country territories qualified for potential inclusion. Now, data availability is a significant analytical constraint as in 2020. 24 of the 79 countries and territories selected for analysis had data gaps or insufficient evidence to produce estimates of people in crisis or wars. This is IPC3 or above or equivalent. In particular, 15 countries have regularly been selected for inclusion, but subsequently excluded because of the recurring data gaps. These include Democratic Republic of Korea, Democratic People Republic of Korea, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, which had estimates available only one year over the past five years, and Eritrea. As of September 2021, in the mid-year update of the GRFC, acute food insecurity Estimates covering 2021 were available for 42 countries only, excluding 13 countries and territories like Syrian Arab Republic. Covered in 2020, global estimates published in 2021. In 39 countries and territories that were covered in all editions 
of the GRFC so that we can have a comparable set of countries, the number of people in crisis or worse IPC3 or above, uh, IPC3 or above, or equivalent reach at least a five-year high in 2020, increasing from 94 million in 2016 to 147 million in 2020. The prevalence of IPC phase three or above, meaning the total population facing high levels of acute food insecurity out of the total population analyzed, also increased significantly from 13% in 2016, around 21% in 2020. So it is true that we have problems in gaps of data, but even if we just focus on the 39 countries that are across the five years, the situation has get worse, which means that the other country data that we're collecting reflect the same trend. So as mentioned, we expect another increase in 2021, which is really sad news. Now, the GRFC report also aims to identify the most prominent drivers of acute food insecurity for each country territory. We normally classify them in a few set of drivers, which include conflict, include climate issues, and include slowdowns and downturns. Now, these uh, reports, uh, what they are showing in the last two years is also the effect of COVID-19, which is also indirectly affecting economic jobs. No? It basically have ended in uh, slowdowns and downturns that has increased the numbers of, of acute food insecurity. So in 2020, almost 100 million people were in crisis or worse, IPC3 or above, or equivalent in 23 countries territories where conflict was the main driver. This increased by 27 million from 17.1 million in 2019. Economic shocks were a more significant driver of food crisis in 2020 as the indirect impact of COVID-19 exacerbated the fragilities, as I mentioned before. And they became the primary driver of acute food insecurity for over 40 million people in crisis or worse, this IPC3 or above in 17 countries in 2020, up from 20 million people in eight countries in 2019. Although most food crises were affected by weather extremes in 2020, their impact was relatively lower than the other two main drivers. Weather extreme, nevertheless, remained the primary driver of acute food insecurity in 15 countries with around 16 million people in crisis or worse, or equivalent in 2020 of the IPC phase three or above. In 2019, they constituted the primary driver in 25 countries with around 34 million people in crisis or worse. Preliminary estimates for 2021 indicate that a growing significance of conflicts in driving food crisis, this is increasing population acutely food insecure in need urgent assistance. And climate change act as a risk multiplier affecting the socioeconomic conditions, livelihoods and natural resources of people worldwide and increasingly eroding their capacities to cope. And also climate change is creating a new risk and aggravating existing ones heightening tensions between communities. So clearly the situation has deteriorated, but the driver's intensity also has changed, being now economic shocks, one of the major reasons of these crises uh, today. And of course, conflict, which has also played a crucial, a crucial role as is shown in the right panels. Now in food crisis context, the food sectors are the overwhelming recipient of resources. A recent analysis by the Global Network Against Food Crisis shows that the countries and territories characterized by food crises received 92% of all humanitarian assistance to food sectors worldwide, and 44% of all development assistance to food sectors from 2016 onwards. Yet the situation is not improving. In fact, food crises are becoming more entrenched for the different elements and drivers we discussed before. Despite the record levels of acute food insecurity in 2020, humanitarian assistance to food sectors recorded the lowest allocation in the past five years. Let me repeat, despite record levels of acute food insecurity in 2020, humanitarian assistance to food sectors recorded the lowest allocation in the past five years. In 2020, humanitarian assistance to food sectors in these countries stood at 8.1 billion, this represents the lowest allocation of humanitarian assistance recorded in the past five years, despite the fact that acute food insecurity was the highest on record. This decrease has been driven by country-specific issues. 
However, the two largest decreases in humanitarian disbursements in 2020 were reported in Yemen, a 1 billion US dollar decrease, or 50% from the previous year allocation, and the Syrian Arab Republic, which was 147 million, a 16% decrease. This decrease occurred while acute food insecurity was very high in both countries. On average, humanitarian assistance represented more than 60% of all external financing to food sectors in food crisis. Secondly, the remaining 40% of all external financing to food sectors in food crisis was allocated to development assistance. Although it remained well below humanitarian allocations, development assistance to food sectors increased from 5.3 billion in 2016 to 6.2 billion in 2019 a 17% rise between these four years. Today, we are struggling to keep up with existing needs and the latest global humanitarian overview launched at the start of the December indicates a global cost of $41 billion to reach 183 million people in need of urgent assistance in 2022. And we must also must understand that as the food prices keep increasing, the value, the real value of this money allocated to food assistance start to deteriorate because you can buy less food because the prices are high. So it's clearly that we need to rethink how we are acting and how we need to act in the future. If we are to achieve the SDGs, we need to radically rethink how we are addressing acute food insecurity. That means combining immediate relief to affected and at-risk populations alongside efforts to strengthen the resilience in the face of multiple shocks and crises. We have to ensure a systemic shift towards a smaller, more significant way of addressing food crisis and supporting communities at risk of disasters. Above all, impactful action is built on quality evidence. Acting early based on reliable early warning triggers protect lives and livelihoods, and also saves, saves substantially financial resources and upholds the dignity of those most vulnerable to shocks. FAO studies have shown the difference of anticipatory action makes in people's life and food security. For every dollar invested, families see returns of up to $7. But of course, the benefits go beyond money. They translate into lifesavers, future protected resilience, strengthening communities, safeguarded. Recognizing that agriculture is central in anticipating and averting hunger, FAO is among the leading organizations in the field of anticipatory action and a long line time advocate of a shift from reactive to an anticipatory approach to food crisis. Because we really need that dollar to be converted into $7. Because the $1 of immediate aid through food will depreciate as, as long as the prices go up. But if we invest this property properly in anticipatory approach, we will be able to get that those $7 in real terms. Disaster prevention and preparedness measures are key to resilience and can reduce the need for emergencies response significantly at a substantially lower cost. This means massively increasing investments in disaster risk reduction interventions, including use of chore cycle or drought tolerant seeds, rooftop water harvesting and animal health campaigns. Recognizing that it is predominantly rural populations being hit by rentless and repeated shocks and crises, appropriate response must take into account their need and their priorities based on seasonality. Agriculture cannot wait for other priorities to be addressed. Seasons come and go, whether we catch them or not. We know that at least two thirds of those experiencing acute food insecurity are in rural areas, making their living from agriculture. In many food crisis countries, these figures are even higher. In South Sudan, this is the highest as 95%. The livelihoods are being decimated by conflict and recurrent floods. In Afghanistan, four out of five of the estimated 22.8 million people projected to be in acute food insecurity from now through March 2022 are rural. Rural livelihoods, farming and livestock production are key centers of gravity. If they fail, then there is a very real risk of total system collapse. When these systems collapse, when suddenly large proportions of the population cannot access to food, 
significant deteriorations in food security can emerge rapidly. In Somalia, for example, in 2017, we saw people slide from IPC2 to IPC4 emergency or five catastrophe in months. And as recurrent shocks stop them from producing food, this get even worse. Yet this is not reflected in our collective humanitarian response. Agriculture is massively underfunded in emergencies, but is among the most cost-effective humanitarian frontline interventions saving lives today and security food for tomorrow and the day after. Take the example of Afghanistan, where four out of five people experiencing high acute hunger are in the rural areas. An investment of $155 in wheat cultivation assistance package can supply a family of seven with enough staple food for a full year. This is less than one quarter of the cost of purchasing the same amount of grain on the local market, which a farmer without income cannot afford. The alternative is around $1,080 to cover the minimum food basket needs of a family for those 12 months. FAO estimates that with just 1.5 billion less than the 4% of the US 41 billion required across all appeals for 2022, we can save the lives and livelihoods of 50 million people. Agriculture not only offers an immediate means to halt hunger, but lays the pathway for resilience building and out of crisis, alongside the humanitarian agricultural assistance, larger scale investments in addressing vulnerabilities and the root cause of acute food insecurity are critical. For example, through conflict sensitivity approaches and improved natural resource management, such as mapping and demarcating livestock transhumans routes and providing services along those routes like water, animal health support, education and nutrition support or strengthening market value chains to add value to produce. So colleagues, it's really important to understand that if we don't touch agriculture, we're not touching properly rural areas and therefore we are not resolving the problem. So any plan to build back better from COVID-19, it doesn't include the rural areas and specifically agriculture will fail from definition. And it's essential also to bring agriculture into the emergency areas of conflict, which is one of the major drivers of food insecurity. So let me stop here and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, truly data-driven presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Oh, uh, thank you very much. So one of the first, uh, a nice place that I think we can start having this conversation is uh, to really uh, talk about the implications of the data gap. I think you mentioned it in, at the outset of your presentation that uh, we don't have data for every place as much data as we would have loved to. So what do you think the implication of this gap would be? Initially, um, uh, yes, thank you. No, 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 this is a very good question because data is sometimes not uh, taken seriously and the role of data could be crucial, no? Let me, let me it's not only the fact that we we don't have data for countries that were before in food crisis, but it's also a policy tool. Let me give you an example. COVID-19 created a huge shock to income, okay, of people because of the lockdowns, because of the closures. And remember, in most developing countries, we have huge informal economies. And they didn't have a way to sell because they were closed. The economy was closed. Now, the way governments tried to minimize that was expanding their cash transfer programs. But the way they did it was transferring money to the people that were already in their listings of that they were food insecure and so on and so forth. But COVID-19 opened enormous amount of new hotspots of food insecurity. And if we didn't have the data available to, to identify where these new hotspots were, a significant amount of that money will have been wasted. And that's what happened really. It's true that cash transfers had to reduce the, the potential effect but there were a significant amount of the population that moved into poverty. This was extremely relevant for Latin America because Latin America were middle and high income economies, most of those countries. But the problem they face is that they were informal economies. As the lockdowns continue for more than one year or two, these people depleted all their savings. And now all of them, which were middle class, move automatically to poverty or extreme poverty. 
And now it will take years for them to recover their working capital because they don't have access to the financial sector. Now we have tools to collect that data, but we didn't have the donor money to be able to collect at the velocity and for all the countries we needed. So it's something that is not only donors, but also countries need to understand that they could have saved enormous amount of money if the targeting was better. Yeah, I, I really like that response. And um, it also brings uh, the question, we'll go back to other issues. But I think it's better we sort out the uh, issue of data as, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, from your experience in this, in this capacity, what do you think is driving the reluctance of countries to gather this data? And of course, to also, for those that are gathering them, to make them uh, as truthful and as openly as, as openly accessible as possible. Because if you look at the way COVID has been, COVID has actually shown that uh, data gathering is not something that is, uh, that is not possible for most countries to achieve. We see countries sharing data every day of the number of new cases, but we, in the, but on the other hand, we see them uh, not giving a true picture uh, regularly of what the food crisis in their country is. So what do you say to that? No, look, there are several issues of, of the reason. One is, uh, I think it's still there is a lot of uh, lack of information on the cost effectiveness of having data in the time that you need it. And the reason is because uh, many countries keep collecting data through their statistical offices that not necessarily is useful. So donors and people believe, okay, you're just doing an exercise of data collection, but in the real life decisions, that data is not necessarily useful because it's not real time data. But today with the technologies we have in place, we can do that, okay? We can create poverty maps, which are close to real time today. We can measure through the food insecurity experience scale information of food insecurity very quickly with just 15 or 20 questions. And we have validated that, we have tested. So I think the technology and the world is changing and, and donors need to understand that. On the country side, the problem is politics also. No? And, and sometimes some policymakers believe that not providing the real information will help them. And that's the worst truth. No? Because a country should reflect what is happening. And yes, if they fail, they need to correct their failures. So the worst thing a country can do, at least in my belief, is to hide indicators of hunger because food is a human right. And because of politics, you cannot damage life of people. So I think it's really important to have a strong civil society, a strong public information so that people can force countries to provide the correct and the real information. And countries should take it as constructive, should take it, yes, I could be losing the election because of this. But it's important that we do the corrective actions until I am in government. They shouldn't be thinking yeah. because of hiding information, I will win an election. So they need to be very careful on how they handle this information. Yeah, I agree with you. Openness, irrespective of the outcome or the implications of your openness is really, really critical uh, across board. And I think it's really important for leaders across the world uh, to invite this and actively embrace this. Uh, we have a number of questions already. Uh, so let me get some across to you. Douglas Carlson will, uh, it's taking us back to um, the two, uh, the food crisis serving as a tool for conflict. Uh, so there, there is a question, how does overpopulation and overconsumption figure into the picture of the global food crisis? And you mentioned Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban wanted it. So can you answer the first question? I think the second one is a, is rather a comment. So okay. the rule of the first one? The rule of so how does how does overpopulation and overconsumption figure into the picture of the global food crisis? Yeah, no, it's important to understand uh, the definitions that I was trying to, to bring. No? So the drivers of, of food crisis are essentially climate, conflict, slowdowns and downturns. And COVID-19 has exacerbated the slowdowns and downturns. And I will add one more, which is huge inequalities. No? Huge inequalities also are being a driver behind uh, what we are observing today. Now, that you are undernourished or overnourished doesn't mean that you are not in a food crisis. So you can be overnourished, but badly overnourished, which will end in health problems. So undernutrition and overnutrition are a, a form of malnutrition that we need to, to, to capture. 
But clearly, in the case of the acute food insecurity, which is what is behind the IPC phases, we are talking of lack of access to food. Okay, so in locations in a country where, for some reason, people cannot access to food, we are not looking at overweight and obesity, which is the overnutrition. We are looking of lack of access, so we are looking at the undernutrition problem, and that's why we call it acute food insecurity because the choke is in a short period of time. If we are not able to resolve that short period problem, then and it repeats several times, then we can end in, in chronic undernourishment, which is the POU that I was explaining before. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Roman is asking this question, and I think I would like you to take it from uh, the solution proposition perspective, because I think it's also important for for you, uh, for HFAO to understand the fact that um, journalists just saying this number of people are going to bed hungry uh, gets boring over the years. And so we always want to find a, another angle to reporting the food crisis. I think. Uh, this is so. Take these as uh, FEO's propositions in terms of recommendations for solutions approach reporting. So the question is just: What should the world do without about food crisis? Given that conflicts are a leading reason for food crisis, we are now at the brink of another conflict in Europe, and that is quite concerning. So, for the perspective of so, uh, journalists that want to report on solutions. Uh, to the food crisis, uh, what uh, options are available from the angle of Raman's question? Yeah, basically what we are arguing, uh, there are four elements that we need to take into account. The first is the prevention, okay? The second one is anticipatory action. We are saying that $1 invested in anticipatory action will give a return of $7. The third is appropriate and timely humanitarian response, which is linked to proper targeting. And the fourth one is resilience building. And resilience building has two elements. One is being prepared or being alerted before the shock happens. And that's where we need to have really good early warning tools. A One Health approach to avoid problems like COVID-19 or other potential zoonotic diseases or pandemics and insurance. And the second element of being resilient is to be able to cope with the shock when it occurs. And that is linked, and our position here, it is linked to being more productive, more efficient the way you produce, having the infrastructure that is needed to be able to move the commodities to the markets, having trade, because in, type, in times of crisis, trade is essential. For example, if something happens between in Ukraine right now, they, between Russia and Ukraine, we, are, we mean that we have 25% of the exports of cereals. No? Just blocking the major port in the Black Sea could create a significant price spike. So again, we need to have infrastructure available and food being able to move. And that is what will make it more effective the interventions and the solutions to these type of problems. Yes, uh, thank you. And um, the next thing is, uh, what are your concerns about, um, personal concerns about engagements with journalists covering the food crisis? Like, add me any thoughts, any recommendations? Are there issues I think they are getting wrong? And what do you think we should still focus on? No, I, I don't think uh, it's not concerns. I, I think it's really important for journalists uh, to understand the difference uh, of the different concepts. That's why I try to provide, uh, and I will more than happy to share the PowerPoint, the difference between with what is acute food insecurity, which is normally what you hear, uh, what you hear from the WFP, for example, and what is the problem of chronic uh, undernourishment. There are two very different concepts. The second thing that we need to be careful yeah. is not being alarmistic just for being alarmistic. We need to be evidence-based. So having the bigger number doesn't mean the number is correct. We need to validate the number and to look at alternative sources to validate that number. I think that's essential because many times we prefer to put a heading of a big number when we don't necessarily know it is true. And it's dangerous because it could create a reaction and it could create some countries to make measures like restraining imports or exports, which could have an effect over prices. So I think journalists should, should do as much effort as possible to collect different sources of evidence so that the number they put up is the correct number and not only focus on, on, on the alarm. I know the alarm calls for people and reactions, 
But we need to be careful because that alarm could have a consequence. So our actions have consequences. Uh, and we need to be careful on what we, we provide. And remember, again, we could be affecting people which are in, in significant levels of acute food insecurity and which their lives could be at risk if we do not act properly. No? So, so for me, that's extremely important. And I think journalists can do. I, I can give you an example. No? When we measure the, the fees, the food insecurity experience scale just after COVID, we got really dramatic numbers for certain countries in Latin America. And we were not so sure because the number, the change was so big. So we work with journalists. In this case, was a, a big uh, journalist uh, team, and they went to the country. They went to the locations we indicated the hotspots were, and they worked with us to try to validate that. And then they built very nice uh, st stories around that, but based on evidence, which helped us enormously to transfer to the governments how bad the situation was and why it was so urgent for them to react. So I think uh, journalists can be play a crucial role in communicating information but needs to be prop correct information and they need to make an effort also to, to work, to help us also to communicate these things because these are serious issues that are affecting lives of people. Yeah, so um, does uh, FU have uh, any data around uh, who are the most food insecure? For instance, uh, the marginalized community, the indigenous people, etc. Do you have this kind of data? Yes, for certain countries, we have this aggregate data at the subnational level. We can identify the locations where the major hotspots are. We can also disaggregate by gender, for example. Uh, and in some cases, also, we can identify if it's indigenous people or not. Uh, again, we are doing as much effort as possible. All our data is public, it's in FAO stat. Uh, as much efforts as possible to capture that. For example, we just launched last week a, a, a new way to measure rural poverty, which is the multidimensional index of rural poverty, which tries to understand better the concept of rural poverty by bringing more variables to explain it, which is a, an improvement over the global uh, multidimensional poverty index, but specifically for rural areas. So we keep working hard to try to bring more evidence, but still, of course, there is a lot more to do. No? And what about um, what uh, resource do you think FEO has that may seem to be underutilized? That you think oh, we have this uh, resource that um, doesn't seem to be well utilized? Can you repeat? I, I didn't get your question. So, do you um, what other what resources? What kinds of uh, information database do you think uh, from your personal? perspective that the FAO has that may seem to be underutilized in oh, no. Look, yes. yeah, no, FAO has an enormous amount of information. This type of reports, the ones I show, the, the, the crisis report and the SOFI, the State of Food Insecurity and Nutrition in the World, these are two flagship reports. But the, the amount of data that we have in FAO is enormous. We have developed something called the U.S. Special Platform of Hand in Hand Initiative. It has millions of layers of information up to date uh, of what is happening. We have real time information on, 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 for example, of mobility of vessels around the world. We know where vessels are being stuck during COVID-19. We know which ports were able to move, where is the congestion level. So our job is to try to, to document through data what is happening in the world. Uh, we can we can tell you what will happen if a key exporter uh, decided not to export anymore, if a key importer decides not to import anymore, we can model the potential impacts. So there is an enormous amount of information around our FAO stat and also our core publications that many journalists can use. You know, it's, it's very, very interesting, but when we launch the SOFI, for example, which is our flagship publication, normally it's launched uh, in New York, uh, in, in the high-level panel, uh, the, 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 the coverage of the media is only for the first week or so. After that, nobody covered it. And in this publication, we're telling the world what is the situation in terms of chronic undernourishment. But the coverage is, is just because of, this, of the number, because of, it, it's just basically the first five pages of the report. When there is so much inside the report that can be used, to raise attention and to create a change, not only on the countries itself, also on the donor community. 
So my plea will be, uh, look at the whole reports that we produce, look at all the value of data that we have inside, and don't take these reports as just one number uh, that has increased. Uh, look at the reports of what is behind those numbers and what are the drivers of those numbers and what can be done to change those drivers. Yes, uh, I do agree with you on that. I think um, we we also need to also uh, give it back to the organization because um, many times the engagement, uh, the interaction between my ecosystem and the others often it could be limited to when there is a major announcement happening. And I think um, if uh, when there is no major announcement, uh, there are insights from already uh, with this report that could be of relevance. Uh, I think even outside the, in the uh, period where there is something urgent to announce, it's always also important uh, to reach out. And I would also like to share, um, I think I would like you to catch uh, some breath uh, well, I would like to uh, share this um, interface uh, so that any individual that is interested in accessing uh, some tools from the FEO uh, is able to do so. For instance, uh, if you, um, the data session that is talked, uh, you can look at uh, these reports here and um, lots of things that you can actually do uh, to really get insights and uh, regional perspectives on, like you can see in this report, uh, data from over 245 countries uh, are made available uh, for these uh, totally free. And um, this is uh, one of their flagship publications and uh, the food price uh, index is also something that is really, really worthy uh, to do. And I also think um, uh, while we, while I, while I stay on this page, something I also wanted to talk about is um, being able to work on these things and not just staying in isolation, keeping to this story, uh, to these uh, issues only. Are there opportunities for cross issues, uh, focusing on cross issues that go beyond the uh, limitations of the FAO? And which strong issues do you think uh, the food crisis can better be paired with? Uh, to expand the body of knowledge and be able to do more thorough uh, investigation and reporting? No, that's, a, that's an excellent question. You know, normally we used to work in silos, no? Number of undernourished, number of acute food insecurity, uh, temperatures high, climate change. And that's a big mistake. Let me give you an example why the, 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 the interrelationship and the interlinkages are so important. In the last years, we have been talking a lot about climate change. And most of the developed countries are pushing countries to do a change in the energy mix, meaning move away from carbon to other renewable technologies that will emit less, okay? And that's correct. But we need to understand that that will increase energy prices like we are observing today. And we need to understand that an increase in energy prices will increase fertilizer prices, like what we are observing today. And we also need to understand that increasing fertilizer prices will affect food. So if we are in a world today of 121 million people undernourished, 166 million, 61 million more than last year, and the price of fertilizers are going up, and therefore the food prices are going up, why am I changing the energy mix? I will have a world where everybody is hungry and dying because of food, uh, but yes, energy mix will be better. So there are trade-offs, there are interlinkages. So we need to figure out what are the policies that will allow us to resolve the core problem, which is feeding people in the world, and also at the same time, minimize emissions. But we need to be careful that certain policies could really damage food insecurity. So those interlinkages are central, no? And that's what we are trying to do at FAO now. We are trying to look at the whole system. We call it the agri-food systems because whatever we do in one location affect the other location. Even we are doing a game to explain people. This is called change the future, change, change the game, change the future because it's important for people to understand the concept of trade-offs. Every action we do will have a trade-off. And if we are not clear on what is my objective function, as FAO, we want to reduce hunger. We want to reduce poverty and we want to reduce inequalities, okay? If I want to do that, what will happen if I do that? I can put technology, increase intensity of production, that will affect my environment, it will affect my land. It will create a trade-off over emissions, it will affect climate. 
what I, how I can do it, what pathway I need to follow that will minimize those trade-offs. So again, the interlinkages are central and we need to understand it. Yes, and I, I really, really agree with you. And I think um, this intentionally seeking out these interlinkages uh, would actually go a long way in getting very robust uh, reports. Um, and of course, exclusive insights uh, for individuals that are interested in exploring uh, this context so that you're not just talking about the proportions of individuals that are going to bed uh, without food, but you're also looking at very, very related, strongly related issues that maybe an entirely different organization uh, may actually be uh, focusing on. And um, so I will also want to uh, commend uh, the team uh, at FAO, actually uh, the communications team for really being uh, super up and doing. And uh, one of the things that I have also come to realize is that you can actually get uh, access uh, to them. I've tried it personally uh, in some of the reports that I've done and they were able to actually get me uh, local contact in any part of the world. So if you are doing a report and you would like uh, the feedback of the FEO or needs to further embellish and uh, improve the quality of your work, uh, you should use the uh, contact page, the media contact page uh, on the FAO website. Uh, just send a mail and uh, tell them which part of the world you want uh, You want that expert from and uh, they are going to connect you uh, to the right expert. And also take time to check out the website to look at the various reports uh, that they are going, they've been pu pulling, uh, pushing out. And uh, these reports are really, really thorough, professionally done. And uh, they may not be the main story, but would actually open your eyes to issues that you can personally explore to actually write uh, something that is thorough and properly done. And uh, so what issues do you, uh, somebody would like to know, what issues do you think uh, is being done, is being got, is gotten wrong? in reporting the global food crisis. I think you've touched on them before, but I think uh, since this person is asking as a full question, it's really important for you to shed light on that. No, look, I, I think that the, 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 the major concern I have seen, at least in my case, is the confusion of the numbers, no? Uh, don't put a number unless you're sure. And a report is not enough. You need to check the number, validate the number with the experts so that you have the correct number. Because sometimes you can create a shift in decisions, uh, which could create a problem. Uh, the second element, which I think is really important, is help and put pressure on policymakers and IFIs, international organizations, international banks, to understand the importance of rural sector and the importance of agriculture in the rural sector. Everybody is talking of building back better, but nobody is talking about the rural sector and agriculture. And that's the worst mistake ever. Basically, billions of dollars will be thrown out to the trash in short-term interventions. That the only thing they will do is create distortions rather than resolving the serious the problem that we face. So don't let you be driven by slogans let you be driven by evidence. I, I, that, that would be my, my core message. We are driven too much by slogans. Yeah, I agree with you. So many slogans that sometimes we forget what the key message is uh, from the outset. Uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to know uh, what do you think, uh, what are your last remarks and um, what, do, what message do you think should be taken from today? No, oh, my, my, my core message here is uh, it's very important to, to, to raise the situation we're facing. We're facing a pretty bad situation. And the panorama doesn't look good for the future. Uh, and I'm sorry, but that's the reality. I, I have to, to talk with the truth. Uh, the number of undernourishment has increased substantially. The number of extreme poor, basically we have lost 10 years or more of reduction of extreme poverty. This will have consequences. Not even that, think on the schools. No, Schools has been closed to kids for a year or more. The consequences of COVID-19 will be very serious. And in many regions of the world, like in Sub-Saharan Africa, we still are not seeing the real consequences because they were delayed in the process of COVID-19. They were like a year delayed. We will see it in 2023. 
so or at the end of this year so it's important to raise these issues in the best way possible with the best possible information and trying to help uh, for countries to make the proper decisions and for international organizations to make the proper decisions so the more evidence you can bring the better it will be and we are here more than happy to help uh, to do that providing all the data that we do and we collect uh, and to try to explain the data that we collect i, I think that's really important uh, being a reporter is a huge responsibility uh, and, and as a result of that uh, uh, you need to really research what you put out. Nobody is asking uh, uh, you to be a, an economist or a specialist in, on a specific topic, but it's really important that you get the best possible information from multiple sources so that you really inform consumers in the best possible way. The last thing you want to say is that there is a, a, a conflict or there is a, a riot because of an increase in prices of food when really the problem was that the country was subsidizing oil and the oil price was moved to real numbers because the subsidy stopped. So again, we have to be careful uh, on what is behind the problem so that solutions can be brought because at the end of the line, you are, you are creating information for the civil society to make governments accountable for. And your role is a role of accountability, which is extremely important. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you said that like somebody that's very really passionate about the subject and um, ensuring that this thing is actually done properly well. Yes, and I think uh, uh, you've agreed to share your presentation with us and uh, we'll be able to share it on. So if you would like to access it and you're not part of our forum, uh, you can quickly do that uh, by clicking the link that I just put up now and be part of it and I want to uh, that is where we will share the uh, the presentation later. And uh, if you would also like to access more resources, uh, uh, we have this uh, very impressive, um, very thorough and ex expansive uh, database of resources uh, for that can help you in what you are doing. I've also put the link uh, right there. And to learn more about this forum, I think you should also check out our webpage. Uh, which I'm also putting up here. So I really want to appreciate you uh, uh, for joining us today, uh, Maximo. You've been, um, and everybody at the FAO, even though you are seeing Maximo, uh, is a lot of, a uh, lot of individuals came together to ensure that uh, this came to pass. I just want to appreciate everybody. And some of them are also actually in attendance, so I can see their names. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for helping us to pull this up. And, uh, We'll be back here on another meeting uh, with other session, interesting and uh, exciting, educative and uh, informative. So thank you and uh, have a lovely day. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.